Hello all, and welcome to the seventh episode of Essence of Wonder. Today we're going to have the masters of urban fantasy on the show. We're going to have Charlene Harris, Patricia Briggs, Dana Cameron, and Tony L.P. Kertner, also known as Lee Perry. And with that, I would like to introduce my co-host, Karen Castelletti. How are you doing, Karen? Thank you, Gadi. I'm doing just fine. Perfect. How are you doing? Excited? There I am. Welcome. I think we're a little bit lagged there. Let's try this again. Are you excited? Oh, I am. Uh, well, I would be excited if I wasn't a New Yorker. And uh, all self-respecting New Yorkers know to play it cool around their heroes. So, uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, playing it cool. Didn't you date someone once, almost date him or something, like that, just because they said they read urban fantasy? Uh, <laughs> I, I considered it. There were other problems. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of rare to find a guy who likes these books, <laughs> to be honest. Well, dear audience, I would just like to say at this stage that we actually had a much more sophisticated introduction planned, but we're kind of fangirls. Uh, we are fangirls. <laughs> uh, Gadi and I actually met um, maybe five years ago at a tech startup program, um, which, you know, think a bunch of really, you know, excited tech nerds, mostly guys who all want to change the world. And we had gotten to talking about body language and how you can, you know, what you can tell from somebody about their body language. And uh, I know I, I liked and trusted him because I admitted the truth to him, which is that most of what I think I know about body language came from this series of books about a coyote shapeshifter. I read that book. I'm just saying I love recommendations and I love Cameron's recommendations that I did. And here we are doing this show about urban fantasy. So let's talk a little bit about urban fantasy, Karen. Um, you love, you even write in this genre. I mean, urban fantasy is my favorite genre and it's this strange little jewel of a genre uh, because it sort of exists on the crossroads of like five, six, seven, eight other genres. I mean, obviously it's, you know, it is fantasy. It's primarily within the fantasy genre, but it borrows and nudges up a lot against romance so much so that it's, it's got its cousin paranormal romance, you know, off to the side. Um, certainly, um, there's a lot of mystery in these books. A lot of them are actually structured almost as crime procedurals. There's a lot of crime procedural in there. Um, I mean, there's, it's similar to borrows from dark, dark fairy tales, magical realism. Um, like it's, it's a, it's a strange little spot on the map. Well, you might meet, might, might expect me to say the gumshoe detective because you know, I do like that, but I'm actually attracted to the Western part of it. They are kind of Westerns. Uh, some of them even even pull from that in their title, but the the sort of idea of the lone gunslinger, you know, black and white hats, kind of off, off on an epic quest against the world, um, almost almost a little bit noir. I think that the mystery one is kind of where it connects for many people. It's what resonates for many readers. The genres are surprisingly close. In fact, I believe a lot of writers do both. Dana, Dana Cameron on our show today, has actually been uh, awarded with the, a mystery award for an urban fantasy story. I think the very first one. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, she, she was. Um, and it's, you know, it's a real grab bag. Um, Tony uh, Kellner, who's also going to be on our show later today, actually got her start, start writing limericks for a Dungeons and Dragons magazine back in the day. Um, but if there's anything that being a fan of the genre has taught me, it's that a, a hero can come from anywhere. <laughs> we can find our way to urban fantasy from, from many different directions. Um, but, you know, to, to ask, like, what, what is the core of the genre? For me, it's the fantasy. It's in the name. Our urban fantasy, it it's borrows heavily from fantasy, but the setting, it's kind of dragged a lot of our own issues, problems, and, and just realities into it. And so it's really set right here and now. Um, this actually reminds me of how I discovered Charlene's work. Um, I was taking a writing class at MIT, and the professor said something that, that stuck with me and made me go find these books. She said, if, if you really want to see how a setting, like a really great idea of setting can become a main character in a story, you should read the Southern Vampire Mysteries by, by Charlene Harris. Because uh, you've got this brilliant idea of putting a telepath in the deep south where, you know, everyone's very polite, but this telepath can, can tell what people are really thinking. Well, I, I, you know, going back to this allegory of vampires as a minority, demanding mm -hmm. acceptance, the, this becomes a, a really a, a rich social commentary. Um, it's exactly what speculative fiction is about. It's about what I love about it. It's about exploring humanity, exploring 
societal issues from an unprejudiced point of view. It's like throwing you into a situation that's similar to your own, but you might develop an opinion that's actually opposite to your own, and these worldviews at some point would just collide, and that's so incongruent, the mind bends. And urban fantasy is not different in that. In fact, it kind of exemplifies it with our own prejudices. It's kind of superimposed on shapeshifters and vampires. Yeah, there's really a lot of magic in, in these worlds and in the world building. And because we have so many of the masters of this genre with us today, uh, one of our big events today is going to be a panel on world building. And to with, with Patricia, Charlene, uh, Dana Cameron, Tony Kellner. And uh, as an appetizer, you know, this leads us into our, our first segment, which is a short reading that Patricia sent us. Um, so each of the four authors has chosen a short reading of their work that they've asked us to read. So that sort of exemplifies a different element or aspect of world building and that they'll want to talk about in the panel when we all group together later. So um, without further ado, um, this is the reading that Patty sent us. This reading is from um, A Seal and the Not Date, which is a short story that came out just a, a couple months ago. It is in the world of her, her larger um, novels of Mercy Thompson, but it's the second uh, in a series of two short stories that she's written about um, this character, a seal. So without further ado, I, I give you a, a, the opening of, of that short story. A seal in the not date. The old wolf ran, leaping over drifts of snow, his dark brown coat indistinguishable from black in the night. In the summer, his coloring meant he could easily run unseen in the Montana forests, but the snow made that an effect he didn't bother with. It was cold and the silence was deep in these woods, so different from the wilds of his youth. But a seal had been here for years now and he ran most nights to excise the demons of memory and to calm the raging wolf who shared his skin. Even the cold that made the snow squeak under his paws was an ordinary and familiar thing, though he had been born to much warmer climes. Someday soon, he was sure, these runs would not be enough. His wolf would break free and start a killing rampage that only the Maroc who ruled them all could stop. He wished that he was certain the Maroc could stop him. They thought it vanity that he had come here for his death. He owned that vanity was one of his sins, but he knew, and the Maroc knew, how deadly he was, how old he was. Just because he was vain did not mean he was wrong. Surrounded by mountain wilderness, his home allowed him privacy for the brutal change from wolf to human. When he stood once more in his human skin, a seal wiped off the excess snow and moisture with the towel he left on the porch swing for that purpose. Without his wolf's fur, the night's chill, without his wolf's fur, apologies, the wolf's chill bit at his skin. Unlike someone wholly human, he could have stayed out all night without ill effects, but that didn't mean it was comfortable. When he was dry, he folded the towel neatly and returned it to the swing, drew in a deep breath of the cold air and waited, and waited. But the usual weight of depression, of an apathy that hindered his control of his wolf, did not burden his soul as it had daily the past few centuries. His old enemy was not vanquished, he could feel its touch, but for now it only lingered on the edges of his mind. Inside his house, his computer sounded the reception of an email. It could be an advertisement for potting soil from his favorite gardening site, or a note from his son who ruled a seal's old pack in Europe. Or it could be from concerned friends who had given him a particular gift for the Christian holiday season, the current reason that held his ennui at bay. In the words of Sir Arthur, Arthur, there was a game afoot. He opened the door and walked naked into his home. There might have been, had he cared to admit it, a spring in his step. The email awaiting him was disappointing. He was the lucky recipient of a $100 Amazon gift card if he would participate in a survey by clicking the provided link. A seal deleted that email and another from a Nigerian businessman with bad grammar who would give him money, doubtless in return for his banking information. A seal rose from his computer desk and put on the clothing he'd taken off before his run. Fully clothed, he went into the kitchen to brew himself some tea in the hopes that the task would lend him some patience, which he should only need a little of. They had given themselves and him very little time. Five dates from online dating sites chosen and set up by them, all to be completed in two weeks. He had finished two of them. The first email from his concerned friends had read in part, you should know that all of these people think they have been talking to you and are looking for you to bring a little spice into their lives. 
We have carefully chosen people we think would be very hurt to find out they were unwitting participants in a game. Some of us believe that you would not hurt a stranger just, just to avoid a little discomfort. Others think that knowing that we have informed the whole pack via email and instigated a betting pool will be a better incentive, especially since no one, so far, has been on you attending more than one date. As blackmail, it was pretty effective. They, or possibly he or she, because the seal wasn't convinced two or more people could keep themselves secret from him, and he had not been able to discover who was at the heart of this, knew what moved him. Most people wouldn't have thought he would care that people's feelings would be hurt. Even so, he was pretty sure that no one but himself knew the biggest reason that he'd accepted. Inshallah. A seal had in his very long life accepted that Allah sometimes made use of his most disobedient servant. This game had from the first felt like one of those times. The first two dates had done nothing to disabuse him of that notion. The water had barely come to a boil when his computer chimed again. He waited until his tea had steeped before going back to his desk. Dear a seal, he smiled and sat at the desk. We admit your second date did not turn out quite as we expected. We had no idea that the must love cats woman meant loving cats in the biblical sense. I hope not, muttered a seal, or we really will need to have a talk when this is all over and I find out who you are, my friends. To be fair, the dating site when we contacted them also had no clue that a certain subset of the population had begun to use their site for such meetups. We had a nice chat and we feel certain that in the future they will actually do the background checks that their website promises. May we say that while we owe you apologies, again, for the unexpected way that one turned out, you once more managed to stay within the bounds of our bet. You were with your assigned date for four hours and 20 minutes. It did expose a loophole in our rules. We did not state that your date must be conscious for any of that time, let alone all of it. There were, somewhat to our surprise, considering the circumstances, no dead bodies. There is a slight possibility that Aaron Marks might not make it. We debated, but decided that since he has survived 48 hours after your date ended, and the damage he suffered was from the lioness and not you, we will grant that you have met the no dead bodies portion of the agreement. Since everyone involved was unable to run by the time the date ended, the lioness excluded, it could be argued that you were cheating. But wiser heads prevailed and gave you the nod. However, you are establishing some odd precedents, and we don't think that we would let anyone we cared very much for to date you. The Seattle Zoo accepted our anonymous donation for the care and welfare of the lioness and informed us that you had done the same. That was well done of you. Someday you will tell us how you managed that drive with an unhappy lioness in your back seat. A seal smiled. Maybe he would tell them. Maybe not. And that brings us to your next date. We will restate the rules you have agreed to. You must complete one date with your next victim, or our selected person from an online dating site of your choice. That date must be at least two hours long and you must spend at least an hour and a half of that with your date. No dead bodies, and neither you nor your date can run screaming out into the night. For your third date, we found a person who sounds very normal on platonicplantophiles.com, a meeting place for plant lovers. We would accept credit for this, but there were only two people listed on the site who were within a reasonable distance of your home. After the oddities involved in your first two dates of our bet, we did a thorough background check on both and chose the one we thought would be the least trouble. We trust that Tammy will be less dramatic than your last date. And this is the opening of, of this, uh, of a seal and the not date. Gotti, would you like to come back? I'm happy to, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Karen, I just wanted to ask quickly, what do you think, uh, just, just to try it out here, are you excited? Because earlier you were kind of, ah, and I want to do this weird thing they do in summer camps a lot, you know, are you excited yet? I'm getting no. more excited as, as the moments go on, Gadi. Fair and enough. I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I particularly cannot wait for the, for the next segment that we're about to have. Awesome. So I'll try to be as, uh, off the screen as much as I can. This is more of a women's show for me. But I would like to introduce at this stage Charlene and Patricia. So Charlene's first book came out in 1981, and she's been on so many bestseller lists, I couldn't even find to count how many. She writes urban fantasy, but did you know she also writes science fiction and horror? She has also over 30 books, three graphic novels, numerous short stories, three and soon to be five TV shows, and she has two rescue dogs, Colt and Abigail. And that's pretty awesome, if in my personal view to rescue dogs. But moving on to Patricia, she is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Mercy Thompson series, which we all love. 
In Noble County, the 28 and growing, she raises horses on a ranch. And very recently, she released Smoke Bitten, the latest book in the Mercy Thompson series. And of course, we also want to use this opportunity to thank, thank uh, Sparky, the trusty assistant, meaning Anne. <laughs> and with that, I think I'll just turn it back to you, Karen. <laughs> All right, well, I, I'm actually, I believe, going to uh, turn it directly over to uh, Charlene and Patty, um, who are, are here to talk about Smoke Bitten and whatever, whatever else they, wherever they go with it is great, is fine with us. We're, we're all here. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> here's the book. Can you all see it? <laughs> uh, it, it looks this beautiful. is Patty's latest book, but I have every book she's ever written, uh, including okay, the, uh, all the Alpha and Omega books, too. I love those. Oh, that, the you. short story that you wrote that introduced those two characters is one of my favorite short stories ever. Oh, thank you. Well, you, you know, you're welcome. I never get a chance to say stuff like this, so I'm going to take it while I got it. Um, okay, can I say something back? Is that I ended up buying your very first book the day it came out because I worked at a bookstore and I didn't read mysteries, but I thought it was so uh, such an awesome, um, awesome concept um, that oh, I and read it. Yes, it was awesome. And um, I have read and I own every book that you have ever written as well. Oh, two hearts that beat as one. Right. And I want to say that your Gunny Rose books are my favorite. I just love them. Just love them. Oh, wow. Thank you, because this is, uh, is so different for me to uh, be writing those. But I'm here to talk about you today, though I love <laughs> to talk about myself. Um, but I wanted to know, there are so many questions I've always wanted to ask you. But uh, I know we get asked the same questions over and over. And, you know, you really hate to start that. But I'm going to plunge right in. All right. When you began writing the Mercy series, did you have an overall plan? Oh, planning is such a word that doesn't go with me. Yeah, um, me too. What I did have is I, what I did plan out is a character that was good for more than book. So um, when I was working, drawing up uh, Mercy herself, I had a lot of different aspects of her character that I could work on as the, uh, I figured um, I had four or five books, <laughs> maybe uh, at least three on uh, with her, and I wanted to make sure that even as she changed and grew, there would be more room for new things and new adventures. So in that in that in that sense, I planned it out, but I certainly didn't have as um, you know, Jim Butcher had an overall plan for twenty books and then a trilogy and and all of these um, that. That would be way too scary. <laughs> I can I can take one book in advance, but if I look at four or five books, then I go I I just don't have any stories, so I can't do that. When you uh, began planning Mercy and gave her a Native American background, did you do a lot of research? And what I'm sorry, I don't remember what tribe. Black Blackfeet. Blackfeet. Black, yeah. Do you hear from uh, Native Americans very often about the series? I, I do, um, especially like at book signings. Um, people will come up and talk to me about it. Um, it was, I will say right now, it was, not a, it was not a choice I made because I wanted to write a Native American character. It was a choice I made because when I made her a coyote shapeshifter, um, that meant she was Native American. And, and, um, but I grew up in Montana. Um, we had, you know, Native American neighbors. I have some friends who are Native American. So it wasn't, it wasn't a big reach for me. And my mother was a librarian in the 70s when a lot of Native American lore, um, due to the Native American activists in the 60s and 70s, a lot of Native American lore made it into the um, children's uh, room in the library with um, the accompanying controversies about anglicizing Native American stories and things. So it wasn't that I had to do a lot of research on it. These are just things that I, and I have done research since, but at the time when I picked it up, it did not feel, like, it, it felt like something that I was relatively familiar with. Uh, it's so interesting uh, as Mercy goes through 
the process of admitting that Coyote is her father. Yes. Uh, I mean, she's in denial for so long in the books. Yes. And then she finally says, okay, I'm not completely human. And yet he's such an irritating, frustrating character. Uh, it's not like he's really a dad to her, uh, not like um, the alpha is. Right, right, right. Um, I think I have so much fun with Coyote. Um, if you game, I would say he's chaotic. He would believe he's chaotic good. I think he may be chaotic, chaotic. Um, and his, he, has, he has goals and things he wants to accomplish. And he does it in his own way. And I, have, I think it feels to me um, pretty uh, um, authentic is the wrong word. Uh, pretty, pretty, uh, it parallels pretty well with the Native American stories of Coyote. Um, in that most of the coyote stories were told by adolescent males over a campfire with, with where they could giggle and, and make it warm <laughs> or rude, right? So, so that, that fits, I think. Sort of like if you consider um, a, an ageless 13-year-old with awesome cosmic powers and what they would do to the people around them. So, no, I have a lot of fun, and I, I, like, I like contrasting him with, say, Wolf, who's another, uh, the, the vampire named Wolf, who's a, a, another chaotic character, but he's more chaotic, enigmatic, and- um, Terrifying, I, I think. Right, right? Yeah, I think I, I, have, I have a lot of fun with him. So, um, uh, yeah, so, so I just, I have the, have these people in my play with them. Coyote is one of them. And when I think the story is dragging a bit, or I think the plot is dragging a bit, I find that usually if I throw Coyote in, something exciting happens. It would almost have to. Right? Now, <laughs> about some of the women in the books, aside from Mercy, who of course is braver than most of us will ever be, and Rash. more reckless. Rash. Yeah, rash. rash, right? She is, uh, but she has a very good relationship with Adam's daughter by his catastrophic yeah. marriage. Uh, I think it's so refreshing to have a teenage girl who isn't a brat. She's kind of almost always the adult in the room, right? I, I love teenagers. I worked as a substitute teacher, you know, to support my writing habit for, oh, I don't know, about 10 years. And I loved hanging out with that, with that 13 to 17 year old age group. I find them fascinating. I really like to watch them where the world is, the world is new to them. You know, all the troubles are the, are, are the biggest trouble in the world. All the joys are the biggest joy in the world. And I am, I'm so impressed by the way some of these young people deal with these huge problems in a way that most adults couldn't. And, and so um, I, I, when I brought Jessie online, I have to admit I stole from both of my daughters who were teenagers at the time, uh, young teenagers at the time, but also for my relationships with the various uh, teenagers that I had been teaching and learning from. It was fun. Uh, in a lot of ways, Mercy is so much a better example for Jessie than her own mother. Her own well, mother is just... The kind of person you keep saying, I wouldn't mind if she died. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have to remember that you see Christy through Mercy's eyes. And, and Mercy's eyes are very open. First of all, women, I think, see and under, understand what's going on with other women who are like this better than guys do. Yeah. Um, my husband used to have a saying. He said, you know, um, it's all very well to um, rescue a damsel in distress, but a damsel in distress. But what you're left with is a, is a distressed damsel. So you don't want to marry them. Um, and Christy's kind of like that. Uh, she, I have several people I know, and a couple people I really like who are who are like this, where they always have trouble. Everybody around them is always throwing themselves under the bus, trying to save them from their trouble. And those people are really well rewarded because they're, they're told they're wonderful, they're thanked, they make, they're made felt like heroes. But for me and for Mercy, the biggest thing is, is these women and men who do this are always victims. 
And um, Christy, that was her appeal to Adam, who is at heart a hero. He rescues people. He takes care of people. He um, so he took care of Christy, and that was and that was fulfilling to him. That's and that's the core of what Mercy solves trouble with is that when Christy comes to Adam for rescuing, he is incapable because of the character, because of who he is, of saying no. He just can't do it. Um, and Mercy sees through Christy, and part of that is because Christy doesn't like Mercy either. So she gets to see the unvarnished Christie, um, whereas people like um, uh, Ariely, people like uh, you know, uh, people like Adam, don't always get to see the real Christie. I, I wish I could just sit Adam down and say, just ignore her. Don't right? let her in the house. Right? Yeah, and, and he understands that when she's not in the room. He knows that when she's not in the he room. He does on one level. He does know that for sure. For sure. Another marriage that's baffling is Bran's marriage to the, honestly, the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, She's just seems to have no redeeming characteristics whatsoever, except she dresses up good. And and she takes care of the pack, as long as your name's not Mercy or, or Charles. Yes. Right? And the Samuel shit is a problem with two, but Charles more than Samuel. Um, yeah, and you'll find out more about Leah this next book. I'm working on Wild Sign, which is an Alpha and Omega book. And mm-hmm. Leah's going to play a fairly big role. You should have learned, you should have met more about her in Burn Bright, too, and maybe not disliked her quite as much. That was my hope. One of the fun things, and I know you do it too, I've seen you, um, uh, is, is take readers initial perceptions of characters and change them up and i love introducing these awful people and then and then revealing why they're the way they are and make them likable but it makes them understandable and you know some of some of the characters like ben who start out as really an awful person and he hasn't changed he's still an awful person but a lot of people really like him because they understand where that awful person came from Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going to see more of Leah, you're saying, in, a, in another oh, yes. Alpha and Omega book? Yes, yes. The, next, the next one. And hopefully, I don't know if people will like her, but I think they will empathize better with her at the end of it. And understand, understand maybe uh, why Bran and she have the relationship that they do. It's really hard to say what their relationship is mm-hmm. since we almost never see them interact with each other. Right. And that's, and I really like that as a writer. It's, <laughs> you know, uh, part of writing stories is shared mysteries, right? Right. It, it, you leave people with questions. Well, why does that work? As, well, as long as, as long as readers um, uh, understand it, it feels like it works even if you can't understand why it works as long as that it, it doesn't feel like the author's hand coming down and going crunch uh, uh, which I hope it doesn't that you understand that there's some things going on underneath that whatever narrator is telling the story at the time doesn't know so that there's some reasons that that those relationships work and you know for from Brand's viewpoint that everybody should know by now from uh, Cry Wolf which is the first Alpha and Omega novel mm-hmm. Uh, from Brand's viewpoint, one of the things Leah does for him is she stabilizes his wolf without, without involving him emotionally enough that if something happened to her that he would turn, he, he, would, he would destroy the world, right? Um, so that's, that's what she does, part of what she does for him. That still seems kind of negative for Leah. Uh, you know, like I... I know he cares about me, but he doesn't care enough about me. Brand is, Brand is kind of a, I can't say the word, but Brand is not always a nice person. You know, Brand, know. people go, oh, tell me, I'd love to see a book about Brand. But if you knew Brand as well as I do, then you might not like him as much as you do. He is a zealot. Um, he has one big cause and almost everything else in his life, he would throw under the bus for that one big cause. And to me, being a zealot is... Um, is all right for what they do in the world, but I sure wouldn't want them as a 
um, father, son, slash brother, anybody I cared about because, right. because uh, they're going to hurt you because you're not as important to them as whatever it is that they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, he's, he deserves her and maybe she does not deserve him. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe he does deserve her. <laughs> Well, what's next for you? You're writing a book, an Alpha and Omega book. I'm right. I'm writing an Alpha and Omega book. I'm working on the third of those uh, of the of the short stories about seals dates. I'm working on the third one, which will come out. Um, oh, uh, it's a Carrie Arthur, Arthur anthology, and I cannot remember the title of it. Yeah, Sparky, do you remember what the title of the um, the anthology that the next a seal story will come out in? Something hearts. Uh, okay. okay, well, it's okay, Sparky, it's all right. Um, if, if, you, if people are interested, they can watch my Facebook page, it will come up. Heroic but Hearts. Heroic Hearts, there we go. Um, What's the name there, of it? It's Heroic Hearts. Oh, I'm supposed to be writing a story for that. Right, yeah. you are. Yes. I should have said to be being the sure, operative right? word. That Carrie, Carrie Arthur anthology that we're writing Carrie together. Um, Carrie Hughes. Carrie Arthur is the, oh, Carrie Arthur is She's my, our, my Australian, Australian art. art a writer friend yeah i have a wonderful time with um people's names so i occasionally get them very wrong uh carrie hughes who is awesome okay well tell me what you're reading now oh you know um let's see uh i am revisiting lois mcmaster bujol um i am listening on an audiobook to dick francis who wrote uh, a bunch of horse racing, British horse racing mysteries, and I love them. Uh, they're awesome. Uh, I've been uh, uh, just, a, you know, just a little bit of this and that, trying to, uh, a lot of books that I have, well, I'm rereading the Gunny Rose series. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just things that uh, inspire me to make me want to tell more stories. Oh, that's great. Uh, do you normally read uh, urban fantasy or uh, just do you vary a lot? I vary a lot. Urban fantasy is a go-to. I love, I almost universally love almost anything in urban fantasy. Um, and, uh, but I love Westerns too, which is why I like the Gunny Rose series. Um, I love uh, uh, science fiction, romance. I read a lot of romance. Um, I've been rereading some Jane Ann Cranes from the 80s and enjoying the differences in male-female relationship that, that, 30 or 40 years makes, you know, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So it's, um, yeah, I, if it's a book and it's got print on it, I will read it. Me too, pretty much. There are a few things I don't often read truly terrifying horror. Really. I, can, I can read it as long as it's character centric, but I, my problem with horror is that you know, it's all horror, science fiction, fantasy are all speculative fiction, and and horror and and fantasy are at the opposite end of the spectrums because fantasy is about hope, and horror is about hopelessness, and I have a hard time with hopelessness. So dark fantasy, I you know, I don't mind reading things that scare me. I I mind reading things that make me feel hopeless. Uh, yes. Uh I've read a couple of things that were that way, and it just left me thinking, well, that was very well written, but I don't feel any the better for having read it. We have right? a question that asks if we have read Seanan McGuire's Encrypted series. Yes. Oh, heck yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. She's a very good storyteller. Oh, she is. I just don't know how she does it. Oh, and she's super talented. She can do anything. She's a wonderful singer. She's, uh, she's, just, she's just a pretty amazing person, yeah. What I like about, particularly about Shannon and also about you, is that your level of excellence is consistent. Thank you. Right back at you. Um, I'm glad that I fooled you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for sure Shannon, Shannon is amazing yeah that's true uh since we haven't been traveling this year for obvious reasons uh it's going to be interesting to see how uh the next conventions are going to go 
they're going to be a lot of changes, of course. They have, they have to, yeah, they have to have changes. Um, I think the next convention we're scheduled for that has not been canceled is Dragon Con. And I don't actually know whether that's going to go on or not. I know they've already canceled the parade, the big parade. So, yeah. Oh, is it no? Is that, I see a no? Oh, I say, oh, I, okay, sorry. I'm looking at the screen at, at our, at our, one of our hosts. And yeah, I, 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 unless they have um, effective vaccines, I don't see how they can put on a convention that big. I don't either. Uh, I'm s scheduled for World Fantasy in Salt Lake City. Yep. We'll see. I mean, I, I'm kept my reservations. We'll see if that comes about. We do have some more questions on our little chat line. Do you want to talk about some of those, Patty? Sure, sure. sure. Okay. Um, they're all good. Uh, one right. One woman wants to know if we're going to hear more about Z's past. Of course. Part of the part of the fun of writing these stories is I, I'm. I'm a history major, and I'm not going to claim to be expert at anything, but I'm a magpie. So I, I pull up these little stories that I really like, or I do a little bit of research and find something really cool. And um, and Z is one of those characters that has a lot of a lot of a lot of years of backstory for me to pull up for fun. And they just um, those little stories I think add a lot to to his character and to the fun of the story. Like the the you know bringing the magic mail into um, let's see that was Stormcurst bringing magic mail that he had made and and put on his and put on Tad his son but you didn't really know what it did or or how it worked and I didn't either so I'll be honest <laughs> but but I had a lot of fun with it yeah Underhill really creeps me out good she creeps and me out too she, you know there's nothing more terrifying than a someone who looks like a child who is deeply, seriously disturbed and has power to back it up. Right, and I feel like um, she's gonna add a lot of potential energy to uh, books for a couple, I, I feel like two or three more books, but it might be longer than that. She might be a long running character, but she certainly is um, one, of those, one of those ambivalent characters where they're not really evil, but because their purposes may not go along with the purposes of say human survival, um, it, makes it, 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 it makes her a character that they have to walk quietly around. And I, I have fun with that. When you, uh, do you feel like you're writing about current events in your books ever? Yeah, actually quite often. Um, uh, I don't, how, how to put it? to me it's important that I give people things to think about. I don't want to tell anybody how to think. I, I don't want anybody to read my books and say, oh, I must, I must think this way and go out and, and be, a, be a warrior for whatever cause. But I do like to make, um, I, I like to make people stop and consider what the other side is, is working with. One of the, I got a lot of heat when I made it very clear that uh, Adam is a, is a Republican and votes conservative. Although what anybody thinks a guy raised in the 1950s in Alabama is going, why he's going to be a liberal, I have no idea. But um, to me that adds dimension to his character and, and I, I'll go on record. I hate both political parties equally. I think it's Coke or Pepsi. It just depends on depends on what your flavor of of uh, which which whose money uh, should be running the country. Um, and I don't think we can get away with it just because away from that just because of how much money there is involved in politics right now. I don't think there's any way to get away from having um, uh, forces for not good uh, controlling, uh, but. That being said, I I like people to read my books and and wonder. And if they are liberals, I want to hear. I want them to hear some really conservative ideas that I think have a lot of merit. And if they are if they're conservatives reading my books, I want them to hear some liberal ideas that 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 um, have a lot of merit. Um, there was an incident here in in the Tri Cities where I live. I live in Mercy's hometown. Uh, there was an incident, a police incident, where a, um, a Hispanic male uh, was shot and killed, essentially for being Hispanic male and drunk on the and drunk, I think, on the street, mentally Ill. mentally ill on the street. And if he had been a white guy, they wouldn't have shot him. If he had been a white woman, he would, they wouldn't have shot him. 
And so that came up in, um, in Storm Cursed. I put a little bit of that in, in there. I, I certainly, um, I don't, um, but I just, I just want, um, I think that a good book should linger with you. You should think about things in it, whether yeah. you agree or disagree. Um, that's one of the things I liked about, um, um, oh, it's SVU. Um, what's the, the um, it's a TV show that ran forever. Um, there was special Law and, Order. Law and Order. Thank you. The Law and Order show. One of the things I really loved about it is at the end of the show, you could sit down and you could discuss both sides of the issue um, and, 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 and feel like you were right. And I, I, want, um, I want to pull that up a little bit. The biggest thing I want people to come up with my book, though, is I want them to be in a little better mental space, a little happier than they were when they started yes. out reading my book. Uh -huh. I, I'm happy to put them through hell in the middle, right? But by the end, they should feel just, a, just you know, if they were depressed, they should be a little less depressed. If they were excited, they should be a little more excited, you know, when they finish the book. Uh, just, I just happened to think about this while we were talking about politics. How do werewolves register to vote? Oh, that's okay. So it, it, it helps that they have some really good hackers. <laughs> um, Charles is one. There's a couple other really good hackers who are really good at establishing identity. And it helps that there are certain people in various uh, agencies in the federal government who understand what they are. And uh, some of them are werewolves uh, who, are, who are willing to fudge records and, and work out. So that's how they register to vote. I had often wondered if there were many werewolves in the army. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 army, Air Force, uh, well, Army, uh, military, um, but also also like police, police officers and firefighters and things mm -hmm. like that. It seems to be uh, a trend in, in, I feel like it suits the particular changes that being a werewolf um, uh, instills in people. It gives them an orderly life. And an orderly life is good if, you, if when you lose it and you lose control, you go and kill your friends and family. So, right? I, I just feel like that, that organization is very good for people who are, um, uh, who are unstable in that way. Uh, one of our listeners commented that it would be pretty hard for a werewolf to serve on a submarine. I have yeah. to agree with that. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, although some vampires I know would really like it. <laughs> it would be hard for them to get the submarine to go up at the end, though. Right, right. And that, there's, that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Do you ever foresee writing about non-werewolves, a book with no werewolves in it at all? Sure. Um, yeah, I wrote a lot of I, I wrote a lot of uh, straight fantasy before this. Yeah, and I have some some of the short stories I have out there. I've got short stories that are about just the vampires. Um, it's I don't I don't. It's not. All of my stories are about people, and yeah. that's what's important to me. And I like magic, so I, I imagine I will never write a story that doesn't have magic of some sort in it. But um, to me, it doesn't matter whether they're werewolves or vampires or fairies or, or, um, or um, it doesn't, as far as whether I like to write them or not. Um, I, but yeah, sure. Uh, given world enough to time, hopefully I'll write about everything. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I plan to just slump over at my computer someday. Right? right. That or sounds good to me. Actually, actually, I want to do it on horseback. I want to be like a hunt, like the, there's this wonderful woman who died at age 102 when her horse that she was demonstrating flying lead changes on, that's at a gallop, um, uh, crossed his front legs and fell over. And, and she died at, at 102. Wow. Doing that. that right? <laughs> That sounds pretty admirable to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. We just it is, it got is told awesome. more time. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, <laughs> so okay, I'm um, just trying to I think told. of something intelligent to ask you. Um, Mm. I can talk about horse breeding. <laughs> don't let her. Good. You could. And I don't know anything about horse breeding. 
but I expect so, most people I fix that. <laughs> no, a that's a bit more about your work habits. So, um, yeah, uh, it just depends on what the books. Are. Uh oh, Patty's frozen. Uh oh. Well, I'm just I'm just hopping back in. You know what, Charlene? I think while we get Patty back up and running, I would love to turn that question on to you. And can you tell us about your? We're, you're also someone we want to hear from. Um, I've been having a big slump lately because of the situation. I guess I've been feeling kind of numb and not smart, and uh, I haven't been doing my work like I ought to. But I did just turn in the third. Uh, Gunny Rose book, and it'll be out February 23rd of 2021, which almost has to be a better year. Okay, can you see me now? It almost has to be. Yay, oh, you've okay. unfrozen. Okay, when all else fails, when you're running a Microsoft computer, you turn it on and see what happens. You doing good now? Okay, I'm fine. Can you okay. See all right. Great. And we we back all about uh, possible television adaptations, Patty. Oh, um, well, I have some things I can't talk about. <laughs> so you should oh. all feel really enthusiastic about that because I can tell you there's something to not talk about. I can I can tell you that um, it is TV and not movie at this point, which makes me very happy because I think um, the series. The, the Mercy Thompson series lends itself very well to TV and not so well with movies. The problem yeah. with making a movie out of a book that is not, uh, that is a book like the kind that, that, I, that I write, that Charlene writes, um, is that all they can do is put, the, the stories are told in a way that makes books the right media. And if you take a book and then you make a movie out of it, the movie is never going to be as good as the book. Um, yeah. And there's some, there's some exceptions. I mean, I think Lord of the Rings was perfect for an adaptation as a movie. I think it, I, I think it was perfect for that. But I don't think my books with, with so much of the dialogue being internal are. But as a, the TV series is better because it can focus on the relationships between the characters and they don't have to follow the plot of the novels they can go on with the characters and do something else so i think yeah. that works better yeah and they won't follow the plot of the novel no <laughs> they not if you want them to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's something you can't not even if they want them to I, right i'm sorry that's so okay. i heard you have two more that are coming up Oh, well, they're in those? development, but that is, uh, that is such a nebulous phrase. Oh, that's awesome. Well, they've been in development for a suspiciously long amount of time. So we'll see. It's really no skin off my teeth. Isn't that a horrible phrase? That's like saying I want to keep my eyes peeled. Blech! And you're frozen again, Patty. This is terrible. That's okay. That just means it's my cue to come back and say that, uh, and because I truly do not have any information about this, I can say that this sounds a whole lot like a not announcement of a TV show about one of these shows. And that is very exciting. Uh, and I, I truly don't know anything. I can't, I cannot spoil anything. I have no knowledge, but we, we would be very excited about that. I think. I really hope Patty comes to, to fruition because I would just love to see that. Uh, right. I've been around the, it, this wouldn't be my, this would be my fourth rodeo if either of these comes to, comes to pass. Uh, so it's not as um, jangly for me. I mean mm -hmm. like, hey, if it happens, it's good. Hey, if it doesn't, that's okay too. <laughs> I'm going to try, I'm going to try. I am um, using my phone as that works better. Yep. You know, we, we saw going by in the, the comments earlier that sometimes it's hard to get to in-person conventions. And so one of the big, you know, things that's so cool about this format is that we get to bring it to people who, who 
you know, not only right now aren't traveling, but sometimes aren't able to go to wherever you ladies are. And so, you know, we take the, the pros with the, the cons of connection uh, trouble, but I'm, you know, very, very excited to be able to do and be able to be doing this with you guys. I also, I saw a question about signed copies of our books since we're not traveling, but uh, probably Patty, like me, has signed a number of copies for various bookstores. And if you contact those bookstores, for example, Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas, they will have signed copies because we signed them and sent them. Right. Uh, so that, that would be a good source. And there are a number of other bookstores that, that would also have them available. Yeah, um, the University Bookstore in Seattle for me. Um, the signed page. The signed page. Uh, right now, for a little bit, the bookworm here in the Tri Cities, uh, Adventures Underground. Um, or frankly, you can send me, you can mail the books to me with uh -huh. the return postage, and I will sign them and send them back to you. I will also do that. So, so I would, I'd rather they get it from a bookstore. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Well, I'm assuming that if they, if they buy the book and send it to me, they have bought it from their local bookstore. Yeah, do you, uh, now let me get back to the question where you froze first. Okay, okay. About, about your working schedule. So, yeah, the working schedule changes depending on which books I'm, you know, where I'm at the book process about halfway through the book then when I know where it's going and I have the shape of the book in my head and stuff then I can sit down and I can write sometimes especially if I'm really close to the due date I can, I can write 12 to 14 hours a day sometimes um, but at the beginning it's kind of hit or miss and most of it is I'm, I juggle things around in my head and try to see what shape the story the best way to, to shape the story and, and kind of collect ideas to put in the story. Um, and then this one, I, I, I ran into a problem with the book I'm working on right now because I can't travel. And it takes place in Northern California. And I have a lot of video of Northern California and I've been to Northern California, but not this part of Northern California. Um, and it's because it's a minor part of the book, I can say it, it, that part of it takes place in a place called Happy Camp, <laughs> California. <laughs> and and I might have said I, I might have picked that just so that somebody in the book and now I maybe not may, may not be able to do that but I just want someone in the book to look at Charles and go, aren't you a happy camper? <laughs> so, um, and uh, I but I really would like to get up there rather than just calling people and and looking at Facebook pages and 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 uh, gathering information that way. So hopefully later on in the summer we'll be able to travel a little bit better. And at least I can go through, I, I can go down there and, and visit and, and come back and rewrite. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of a, um, it's cyclical for me. Um, it seems like it takes me nine months to write a book. And it, I may write a book in two months, but if I write a book in two months, I can't put a word down on page for another seven months. So uh, it's, it's the ideas that slow me down more than the actual physical uh, writing. Hmm. Okay. So you, you have actually written a book in two months? I have, yes. In fact, the, the book that I wrote, um, which is Ravenstrike, is the longest book I've ever written. And, and I wrote it in two months, including dropping the last 100 pages of the novel and, and, and just throwing those away and rewriting 150 pages into that 100 pages. Um, but 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 in that you know in that time frame my husband would come down and find me two o'clock in the morning sobbing because i have a party of of i don't know how many people i can't remember anymore seven people but they also have seven horses and uh trying to keep them all straight and all going the same direction at the same time and that's when i learned that horses don't automatically have to be characters in the book <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it's um, I, I not recommended. Um, if I can, if I can do a little study, I, this is what I tell everybody. If I'm teaching a class or teaching or, or talking at a panel, if you can do it, five pages a day is awesome. You sit down, you write five pages yep. every day, and and pretty soon you have a novel. But I found that uh, that lately it doesn't work that way for me. Um, but Another book, it might. It, uh, I've written enough books to know that I have written books in every possible way and manner it can possibly be. And, and each book seems to have its own pattern and its own 
demands. Okay. I've, I find that too. And as I get older, my process is definitely changing. Um, I rewrite a lot more. Do you enjoy touring or does it just wear you out? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I love meeting readers and talking to readers. Yeah. And yeah. I just love the I love standing up and getting questions and all the adrenaline rush of answering that, that question right now. That is really fun. Um, but but it's also hard and it's it's not helped because I have a horse farm. Um, when I leave, I have to find somebody who can take care of the horses and the dogs and the cats. And um, and a lot of times when I travel for books, then my 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 trusty assistant Sparky comes with me, which means she can't be home to watch the dogs and the cats and things. And anybody else who watches my farm, disaster ensues. Two of the last three times my daughter um, watched, my, my youngest daughter uh, watched the farm, um, we lost animals. And not to their fault at all. I mean, it was like I left and the horse decided I'm going to die, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is a terrible thing to do to somebody who's responsible for your, for your place. Um, so, so that's always stressful. Um, it's like they know when I'm gone. It's nothing dramatic happens when I'm home. It only happens when I'm gone. It's because you talk about it in front of them. Right, yeah. right. So it's, it's, um, so that part of it's stressful and I'm kind of a homebody. I like to be home and I'm, and, and I am an introvert rather than extrovert, which means it doesn't yeah. mean that I don't enjoy getting out and, and talking to people and, and, um, uh, you know, interacting with readers, um, but it means that when I when I get back to the hotel room, I'm exhausted. And at the end of a book signing tour, uh, where I'm, you know, maybe five, maybe maybe six days out on the road, maybe longer than that, um, depending when they when they added Emerald City Comic Con to the end, end of it. By the end of that, I can barely talk. <laughs> you know, I get home and I can't say my name. <laughs> so. Yeah, so, so it's a love-hate relationship with touring. I would totally agree with that. I am afraid our time is up. Uh, it's been a thrill and a pleasure for me, Patty. This is always fun, Charlene. I love talking with you. I will do it anytime. Oh, yay. Thank you. You'll be <laughs> sorry you said that. <laughs> no, no, never. <laughs> Yes, and thank you guys so much from all of us. Like, as, as a fan, it is both really cool to get to hear about little parts of your world, uh, especially that we're going to get to explore more in upcoming work, but also to hear how supportive you are of each other's work and of other authors who've come up in, in the chat. Um, it just really makes it feel like a, a kind of a wholesome family. Um, so that's, that's been really fun for me. 